Uh, quick PSA. So today's webinar is really about just uh, a new chapter. The uh, original title for today was Holy Crap, It's June, because that's sort of what we thought the zeitgeist would be after having it made it through May. But apparently there is still more uh, work that has to be done and uh, life is nowhere near yet normal. So uh, we're calling this a new chapter today and we'll talk a little bit about what that means in just a moment. Please use that chat. It is the most powerful thing that we all have in our hands during the next hour as a chance to communicate, give us your feedback, but more importantly, just talk to everyone else in the world of food. Please make sure to select all panelists and attendees. Otherwise, only we, um, the people on your screen right now, can see what you have to say. Uh, so if you want to share more broadly, make sure you select all panelists and attendees and everyone can see it. And if you leave your chat window open, you just have to select that once and you're good to go for the entire duration. Of Did it. The I haven't hidden a thing yet. That's fine. That's fine. I just, I printed the paper and I needed to grab it. I'm sorry. So uh, occasionally, because there's so many Colleen's, we'll, yeah. we'll get uh, some random noises and sounds and conversations. Uh, that's okay. We will uh, tease the people that violate the microphone rule and uh, it'll all still be fun. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, but I would ask if you have somehow used Colleen's link to come in today, uh, please mute yourself uh, during this time so that you do not get called out. So Colleen, the real Colleen, who is on video wearing her, her earbuds, uh, you're going to kick us off today with the game of Name That Snack. And, uh, and before we even go there, I'm going to shut off the polling and we could look at a few hundred votes so far on how you're feeling about actually you no know, let's leave that poll open i take it back we leave that poll open to the side let's go straight into a game of name that snap and for those of you that uh, have not played along before um colleen do not have chat open so you cannot cheat kara you can monitor the chat and see if we're getting pretty good guesses or not from the crowd and for all of you watching um it's your job to guess faster than colleen what this trend is so this is something from uh, our SNAP service, and you can see we're going to show you um, a little bit of information about it. This trend is two words, 12 letters long collectively. Hi. It's, been, it's been growing pretty steadily. Whoop. Uh, we got to meet that mic. It's been growing pretty steadily for a while now, and it's something that most people know. 82% of people know what it is, and almost half have tried it already. So, Colleen, I will unveil the first clue, and when you think you know the answer, let me know or just raise your hand. The first clue is this was originally named in Brazil. And Kara, you can monitor the chat and see if we're getting any good guesses in. The yeah, I think the only reason you asked me to do this is so that you could actually stump somebody continuously. I'm just putting that out there. Uh, well, yeah, we've yet to stump yet. anyone, but I don't think I'm going to stump you either. I have made this much harder, I think. Like the, the clues a yes, bit I already esoteric. can tell. Uh, I already so tell. This is, this no is brutal. Excuses. Yeah, no excuses. Um, the second clue is so many seeds. The third clue, and this gets a little bit more obvious now, so I think we're going to start seeing some good guesses, is it is the most romantic flavor. Kara, are we seeing any guesses I in chat? I think someone just got it, yep. Oh, oh um, I think the second word is fruit. Uh, I gotta write it down. How many letters is this? Passion fruit? You, you, well, you're, just, you're not supposed to actually tell me what, yes, the seven, answer is passion fruit. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yes. eight, nine, okay, sorry. So you're supposed to only tell me that you know what the answer is. You're not supposed to say it yet, uh -oh. but you got it. So you got on the But I'm an time. auditory learner. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just sounding it out to myself. I need to mute myself. We got, we got two more to, to really get this right, but that was good. Okay, so this one's all 11, right, sorry. 11 letters long. Tell me when you think you know the answer, but don't blurt it out. Okay. Kara, you can monitor right. that and let's see how well okay. The, the rest of us do. Clue number one is brassica. So this is something that's been around for a while, actually a long time, but it's more recently had a nice steady increase. It's not something that came out of the blue where that was at 0% and all of a sudden, you know, became the hot trend. Something that's been around for a while, but it's recently started. You think you know the answer already? 
You're kidding. I think me. so. Okay, so so write no. it down so we know you're not cheating. Don't say what it is. Kara, is anyone guessing yet? Yes. Oh my God. Okay. Clue number two is it's all in the head. Yeah, everybody got it. <laughs> <laughs> Who the hell is gonna get this off Brassica? Uh, am I am I dumb that I that, that, that's just common knowledge? Well, no, it wasn't but, like, for me, if you, if, but it was for but others. But if you garden, if you garden then, or you study biology, Latin, I don't know. Yeah. There's just stuff related to that that was way easier than the last one. Oh, okay. You can come down. Trendy as a rice or crust. And then the fourth clue is broccoli says hi. And the answer, <laughs> Colleen? Say cauliflower. It is indeed cauliflower, which has become a real, real big trend recently. All right, last you know, it's a lot harder to spell when you don't have spell check. Gonna yes, more. baby. Okay, this is it. It was mm -hmm. semi-common nice. a decade ago. It's been growing. It's been growing. I'm gonna get mine. Let's try that. All right. So I have just muted a lot of people. Let's see if that works. Okay. Oh, there's another calling that just came in. Okay, I think we're good. Five letters. Best game ever. I know, right? Five letters, growing, um, and it's up to 8% penetration. It is a little bit later in its life cycle. It's more popular with Asian consumers. And the first clue is it's uncrusted. The second clue is it's pretty crummy. Mm -hmm. Kara, are we getting anything yet in chat? Yes. Uh, third <laughs> is light and flaky. And number four, last clue, Colleen. If you can't get it by here, you've definitely been beaten by the crowd. You think you know the answer? Don't tell, don't tell me what it is, but do you think you know? I, I maybe, yeah. Well, here's the giveaway. The last clue. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, Tatsu and beyond. And what is the answer, Colleen? Panko. It is, in fact, Panko. Okay, so Thank that was a lot of fun. It was also sort of a technical disaster, but that's very okay. that make these things so interesting. And with that, so Jack. Yes. Before you before you leave, is like I just want to give a shout out to Mike. Uh, there are many many people who are on the attendee list right now who may saw Mike's face. Uh, when they join. And I just want to say that he is brains and design behind Abraham Lincoln. Um, Axel Rose, we were on a call with a friend this morning, was wearing their Axel Rose t shirt. Uh, Marilyn Merlot, my friends out there, just wanted to point out the shout out to Mike that uh, he is the man to persuade all my friends out there who have ideas for new shirts. He is the man you want to you want to persuade so yes yeah so big shout out so all of the foodscape and the data central character uh characters that we've created uh it's all mike so he is the genius behind all of that um okay so uh last psa please chat tell us what you're thinking and use the all panelists and attendees option so let's see what happened from our poll um Here's what we saw. The question, are you feeling more optimistic about your business today compared to a month ago? And three quarters of you do feel that way. And that actually holds up pretty well. We've seen similar feedback from both um, suppliers as well as the operators. I, I ran over seven minutes. I didn't think it was going to take the whole hour, but I talked a lot. I apologize. So, Colleen, I'm going to demote you right now. I'm going to enjoy the right data now, webinar, so. so that we can... Uh, <laughs> I know, me too. Me too. <laughs> Yes. Good. So um, and I do like that, that technology that's been over. Um, uh, so I like the way cool. some of what they do. Hopefully, did I can just do this one time, Colleen. Yeah. Um, again, any examples you see? Okay. Sorry, guys. This is what happens. You know, it's funny. We do a thing each week where we uh, look at what attendance looks like, and sometimes you see one person attending ten or twenty different times. It's because. Uh, the, they share the link with other people. And this is what happens when you share your link. Everyone starts impersonating you. So, okay, I apologize for that. We will um, continue on. So yeah, we actually saw the same thing both in uh, 
the operator and supplier community where many of us are feeling better about our business as we move forward. Um, but with that, I do just want to say again, thank you. Uh, one, thank you for sitting and bearing through some of the, the technical anomalies that we just experienced, but it was sort of fun too. But more importantly, just thank you for being a part of this for, for so long. Um, you know, we're now in week number 10, uh, amazingly, and I feel like we're still just sort of scratching the surface of all the things that we need to learn about how we can sort of emerge from this as victoriously uh, and united as we can. So thank you again for that. Quick shout out, um, please add this uh, webinar series to your calendar manually. You may not get an automatic reminder in your calendar. So you may just want to do this manually. You could use the same link every single week. So just make a new you know, Outlook appointment or something and stick that link right in there as a reminder for yourself. And we will see you next week and beyond. And then also, uh, we have so much additional new content on the coronavirus microsite at the Data Central um, website. I think it's over 70 different reports and exhibits and state opening maps and traffic briefings and interviews. There's a ton of content there. And you can also now uh, officially download the entirety of our consumer one table research and our operator one table research. Those are both there. They're beefy uh, reports that are available to you as both a PDF and as a PowerPoint. And you can download them right now um, on that page. It's sort of the near the, the, the top of the page. Um, I want to let you know that we have a new interview just posted with Dr. Paul Rosen. I think uh, Dr. Rosen may even be joining us today as an attendee on the webinar. Um, he's a brilliant guy and sort of a personal hero as well. Uh, our Marie Moldy has interviewed him on just the, well, one, he's a, he is the preeminent food psychologist um, and has covered a lot of different topics, including um, disgust and contagion and how people um, think about that. Uh, and the uh, most recent interview is continues our line into what the psychology of a pandemic looks like. So um, it's about an hour long, it's fantastic. Uh, I'd highly recommend you watch both the first interview and the second if you haven't already. Both can be found on the Data Central microsite. So um, some news to kick off with. This is that one track stat that we've been tracking for quite some time now, which is, um, are you definitely avoiding eating out? And you can see we hit that high in sort of uh, the second week of April at 68% of people saying, I'm definitely avoiding eating out. And we've had a continuous decline since. Um, on last week's webinar, we said for the first time ever, we've dipped under 50%, and that has continued to hold true, and it's even declined further, and that number is now back to a 47. So we're back to where we were mid-March. This is a very, very positive sign. Uh, and uh, barring any other crazy news that arises, we think we'll continue to see this number decline. It may not go down you know, 10 points at a time, but a continuous steady decline certainly looks likely at this point. You know, these are interesting times we live in. And um, if you're like, you know, all the rest of us, you probably sort of, probably sort of feels a little bit like we are not just seeing, but actually, um, and not even just witnessing, but sort of experiencing history unfold before our eyes. Um, first with, uh, with COVID, um, now with, um, the, the, the movement for, for racial justice and the protests um, that come along with it. I don't know if we've had many other times in, in our lifetimes where it actually felt like we were experiencing history, right? That what was going on that we were a part of um, is something that's for sure gonna be a significant part of the next generation's history books. Uh, we certainly seem to be in that right now. And I thought it was sort of important to reflect and maybe even preview a little bit what we'd like to talk about um, next week. So, you know, this webinar series is about COVID and uh, what it means for the food industry and for restaurants and other places that serve food and, um, you know, what it means for business as well. Uh, there are other issues too, and um, what's happening today with um, the protests and the movement toward racial justice is incredibly important. And we asked ourselves what role um, we could potentially play in this. And I think we landed on, well, let's do something where we feel like we could actually add some value um, to the conversation. So um, next week's webinar is going to 
uh, deviate just a little bit. We'll still talk about COVID. We'll talk about the latest data there. But we're also fielding some research right now on just what consumers think about uh, the current move, uh, the current protest movement, and how brands are responding. You know, how do, how do consumers feel about brands taking a position? We know, and we've been saying for a while, that one of the next big things that's going to be a, a food motivator is personal values. And leading into this year, it seemed that climate change and climate crisis was going to be that next big area of personal values that was going to drive um, a lot of things forward in food. Uh, that may still be the case. It's not entirely clear because we do see that consumers tend to favor safety even over sustainability these days. But there are other personal values worth talking about as well. So we'd like to highlight some of that research in this webinar next week, um, as well as spotlight just some of the really cool things that Black and other minority-owned restaurants and other food companies are doing in a way that only diversity can bring. So uh, we'll have a slightly different set of topics next week, but it will feel very contemporary and hopefully it'll hit home in some way too. So um, keep your eye out for that. It should be a good one. So with that in mind, um, all of a sudden, we seem to be talking about something other than coronavirus in the news. And we could see what consumers think about this. So given all the things that are happening in our world and our communities right now, um, nearly 60% of consumers, 58% say, I hope the media focuses on something other than COVID. There are more important issues that need coverage right now. A majority of consumers and um, not coincidentally, the exact same percentage um, agreed with this that seeing the coverage of the protests has reminded me that we should focus on other things besides just coronavirus. Um, I mean, this is fairly remarkable in that the coverage has been of nothing but COVID nonstop since, um, since early March. And now there are other things in life that uh, we've decided are really worth talking about. And it feels as though consumers broadly see this um, to be their truth. So the thought is this, um, people are saying, hey, I realize there's other things in life that are worth thinking about. And it seems that the, the news cycle has started to move a little bit in that direction too. Is the ice potentially melting a little bit around us being frozen in place by COVID? So we wanted to maybe just point out a couple of things. Um, here's a look. Let's start with what people are actually doing. What have you done within the past two weeks? So about 40% of people say I've been outside without a mask. About 40% say I've gone out and exercised in public. About nearly 30% say I've gone out and gotten a haircut or some sort of a treatment, which presumably requires someone to be very, very close to you. And you can see what some of the other numbers are as well. Now, these aren't purely additive. You can't just add these all up because you have a number much larger than 100%. One person can do multiple activities. But it's not as though we have all been fully sheltering indoors. So I think that maybe is one of the first clues that we are starting to return to some semblance, even if it's only a little bit of the time, of normalcy in some regards. And if we look at those same things and we break it out generationally, it is not surprising at all that generations are a pretty good predictor um, for which activities are more or less common in certain groups. Basically, boomers are less likely to have done uh, virtually any of these activities, and Gen Zers are the most likely to have engaged in these activities. It's unclear whether um, you know, boomers having avoided them is because the, they're more sensitive to COVID and, and see themselves as being a part of an at-risk population, um, or if it's just that Gen Zers and younger consumers tend to just be more daring overall. But the uh, reality is quite clear that people are starting to do some things, and that tends to be most common with younger consumers today, again, in just the past two weeks. Uh, and it is true, too, that uh, Republicans are more likely to have engage in these various types of uh, activities and behaviors than our Democrats. And what's notable is younger consumers tend to skew um, left politically, right? And older consumers tend to skew right politically. Uh, but here you're seeing sort of an opposite reaction where we saw that Gen Zers were the most likely 
to, to go out and do these types of things, um, and boomers were less likely. But at the same time, Republicans are also more likely, which is counter to what you would expect from a demographic uh, perspective. So you have an even stronger sort of um, tendency based on political orientation than just demographics would predict. Um, so here's the, the next poll question. And this is what I'd like to ask is, think about the news cycle today, right? You go back two weeks ago, everything was COVID. Like the first story, the second story, the third story, the fifth story, everything was COVID. Now you don't see a whole lot of it talked about anymore because we have other things that are important in the world. The question is, what do you think the news will look like two weeks from today? Are we gonna go back to COVID dominating all the headlines or have we moved on and there will now be other news that will grab most of the attention? So go out two weeks at that point, you know, maybe a lot of the, uh, the, the racial justice conversation, the protests, um, you, know, you know, some of that may have subsided a little bit over the course of a couple of weeks. Uh, if we go that far out, will other news replace and sort of grab the headline spot? Or are we going to go back to all COVID all the time? What do you think? Kara, what do you think? If you had to predict the, the newspaper. I think, it, dep I think it depends on if we have a, like a spike or a second wave. Yeah, that would be a good, no. that'd be a good guess. So what do you think people guessed? Do you think, do you think, our, do you think everyone here guessed that we're going back to all COVID all the time or that we're going to move on to other news? So I said the second based on what's happening right now. Um, yep. But I think that COVID's probably not going anywhere. So I think maybe most would disagree with me. Well, uh, never mind. Actually, I'm wrong about all yeah. of these. <laughs> well, you're right in that you agree with, <laughs> you agree with both. I'm people. right. I voted with everybody else, but I assumed I was different. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and I actually sort of am in that second camp a little bit too. And I would say, look, it's impossible to tell exactly what's going to happen and what's going to be, be reported. But keep a very close eye on that. You know, if we merge from, let's say, the current news cycle and we do not immediately go back into fully focusing on COVID, I think that signals something fairly significant. Um, so keep an eye on it. Uh, as the news cycle goes, so does consumer mindset and consumer behavior. So pretty interesting. So one of the, the books that uh, I love and I've encouraged a lot of um, our folks to read is this wonderful book called Influence by Robert Cialdini, in which he talks about sort of the six sort of principles of influence and, persua and persuasion. Uh, and one of those principles is something called social proof, which is you sort of look for cues of what other people are doing to inform you on what you should be doing as well. And as it relates to COVID, here's something that consumers tell us, which is 44%, which is a pretty big number, say that lots of people right now are breaking the social distancing rules so there's really no point in following them myself. I think there is some sort of a critical mass type of thing that happens, right? Certainly the critical mass tends right now still toward uh, wearing masks and being very careful when we go out. But at some point we'll dip below like a certain level that may signal just even, you know, um, subconsciously to others that uh, we don't need to follow the same rules. And again, I'm not saying this is the right thing to do, but it looks like we may, may, be, may be heading in that direction just based on consumer sentiment and what we know about how people act and behave. So the big question is, will there be a big second wave of COVID-19? Well, the interesting thing is that consumers think yes, nearly half think, they, think there will be a major second wave. 36% say yes, but it'll just be a minor one. Collectively, that's 85, 84%. Let's say, yes, we're going to have a second wave. The question is, what should we do if there is a second wave? And here's where it gets interesting. So even if we have a second wave, consumers saying, even if that happens, only 40% say we should lock things back down. The majority say we should keep opening things back up. And this goes back to something that you know, we've been saying for a little while, that it really does feel like the reopening process is probably going to be a one-way street. Uh, it's hard to envision how um, you'll get a majority of people to 
to go along with relocking things down again. Uh, and uh, you could see even in the current data that that's what people are saying as well. Keep in mind, and this is a stat we've shared previously, that people are most concerned not about the restaurant or the store um, or the countertop or the surface or even the staff. They're concerned mostly about other people and patrons out in public. That 72% don't trust others yet to act responsibly when non-essential businesses are open. That's what they're most sort of looking for. So it's brought along this whole piece of, hey, uh, don't be a COVID idiot. So if you've not heard the term, uh, Covidiot, here is the definition, refers to a stupid person who stubbornly ignores social distancing protocol, thus helping to further spread COVID-19. Uh, used in phrases like, are you seriously going to visit grandma? Dude, don't be such a Covidiot. So the question is, will people still think of others as Covidiots um, weeks down the road? Or will everyone have returned to sort of some level of pre-COVID behavior, and we're all just COVID idiots at that point. Who knows? As it stands now, though, what should a restaurant do if patrons refuse to practice social distancing while inside? For the most part, people say, hey, if someone's you know, not following the rules and they're being asked to, you got to just get rid of them. 40% say get them to just leave immediately, just kick them out, they're 86th. Uh, and another 43% say, yeah, you know, give them a chance, ask them to comply, and if they're still not doing it, kick them out. Uh, only one in six say, you know what, uh, it's okay, even if they're not following the rules, just, you know, let them stay and don't hassle them, you know, they should be allowed to be in the business. So the majority say, look, if there are rules, we should be following them. And the question is, how do you actually go about implementing this? We've seen that a majority of consumers have actually said, I'm cool with restaurants and other places having, let's say, assigned staff that are just there to monitor people to see if they're following guidelines and to sort of enforce that. And then you have like really creative places like uh, Disney and its Disney Springs property has assigned stormtroopers, which is awesome to monitor staff and enforce uh, for social distancing. So if you could do this and have it be in brand, that is amazing. I'd, Probably most of us can't do the stormtrooper thing, and hopefully we don't have anything like that attached to our, our restaurant or eating brand. But if you can, it's all the better. I personally would like to be berated by a stormtrooper. I think that'd be sort of cool. Okay, uh, we'd like to get a little bit into what we've learned from our one table work. Again, this is where 200 different companies have come together and provided topics, thoughts, ideas, and Data Central has then gone out and done the research for the benefit of the industry. We've um, surveyed both operators as well as consumers. Uh, and Kara, who's on with us, um, will share some insights that we've learned from this as we go. She'll add some color. Uh, but her team is responsible for putting this amazing research together. It is available to you right now. So go to the COVID research uh, resource page on the Hi. Data Central site, and wow. you can download both the operator and the wow. consumer That's research. Wow. Looks like we still have some fake Colleen's in there. Um, Okay, so let's talk about the consumer piece first. And here's that first question, which is, what are you doing more of these days? Uh, well, people are watching a heck of a lot more TV and movies. There's a reason why things like Tiger King can instantly become part of the social consciousness because people are just at home and the number one activity they have most increased is basically binging on Netflix. I think there is something to this long-term as well, if people end up working from home in the long run, it certainly looks like a lot of us may or will, or at least able to. Um, even as we emerge from the pandemic, there's probably gonna be a lot of just sitting on the couch, watching your favorite movies, taking a break during the day and doing that, and eating while you're doing that too. So think about sort of almost that um, food while doing something else opportunity that both restaurants and other food establishments um, can support. Uh, then two, people are cooking bacon from scratch at home more often. From scratch is the key piece over here. Now I know there are different definitions of what scratch means depending on the particular consumer, but it is something that has increased. And the, the big question is um, whether this will continue to hold after the pandemic. 
if you ask consumers, and here's something that uh, we should all know, that if you ask someone what they expect to be doing in the future, they can give you an idea, but um, it's certainly no guarantee that they will be doing what they say they will be doing. Consumers will by and large tell you that they've been cooking more from scratch at home, that they plan to continue doing this in the future. But there's a reason why they weren't doing it in the first place as well. The, the, the key lever, I think, is whether they become so good at it in the short term that they want to just sort of continue doing it and building on that skill set, which is not entirely clear at this point. Um, it is worth knowing that there are more consumers that are more sort of familiar with how to make food now than before. Uh, but this is really just a counterbalance, a long-term generational trend where each subsequent generation tends to know less about cooking and has fewer uh, food preparation skills than the generation that preceded it. So maybe we see a little bit of a reversal over here. Uh, I'm not yet convinced that this will really prove to be a long-term trend, however. And, and people say, look, when I'm thinking about life and what it means to be back to normal, uh, what I really need is to know that there's a vaccine widely available. And I know there's a lot of um, speculation as to when this may happen. Um, you know, some have said it could be 18 months or 24 months. Others have said it could be as soon as October. I think there was a report today that AstraZeneca says it could have billions of doses ready by uh, the end of the year. Who knows, right? It's, it's, it's completely unclear, but that would mark sort of a true ending point for a lot of people. My guess, though, is that people will feel their life is relatively back to normal um, significantly in advance of that. And it's not going to be so much tied just to simply saying that there's a vaccine there, but they're just doing things in normal life that they have not been doing since March. Uh, on the restaurant side of things, some of these things they're doing um, really has manifested in different types of behaviors in terms of how they actually get food. So here the question is hey, think about, you know, stuff that you plan on maybe doing more or less of after um, shelter restrictions are lifted. So as you emerge from the pandemic, you're allowed to go out of your house again. What are your long-term behaviors? What do you think they're going to be? Um, and you can see in the green bars, these are things that people say I'm going to do more of. The black bars are things that I say I'm going to do less of. And it's not a surprise. A lot of people say I plan on eating less inside of a restaurant. But they also say I plan on ordering at the counter much less often than I have. And instead, I'm doing more calling ahead to place an order uh, or ordering via uh, the restaurant's website or app, sort of that order ahead behavior to sort of counterbalance that. That's sort of the key thing. So one of the things that the pandemic has done is it's accelerating behaviors that were already on trend and were likely to continue growing and it's just made them faster. And order ahead is probably the big one there where during the days of the pandemic, ordering ahead is just as common as ordering at the counter, which was never true in the past. Um, I would also sort of point out that you see an uptick in using a restaurant's website or app to order, but you do not see that same uptick for third-party delivery, right? So if you can see my mouse wiggling around for these bars over here, and, and that really can be um, traced back to the experiences that people have had um, with third-party as it relates to pricing and the fees that they've had to pay. And there's a tremendous demand uh, for a better fee structure, um, certainly for consumers, but, you know, frankly, also for restaurants too, many of which are finding it very hard to, to cope with the commissions and still remain profitable. And I think people really want to support the restaurants directly. Yes. Yeah, there's some services popping up to help them do that too, mm -hmm. uh, which is notable. We'll see if any of them really get the scale uh, that they need. Yeah, I mean, we've had those things where, you know, like, invoices from some of the third party marketplaces circulating on social media, you know, sparking a little bit of outrage. Uh, there's been quite a lot of that. Uh, the other thing we've seen is that cars have really become a safe haven for consumers. You know, cars are sort of part of uh, each person's productive bubble. All of a sudden, it's like sort of your own personal bubble. And, and when people are asked, hey, what's the safest way to get food? Over half say curbside or drive through wins it for me right now. So you almost want to think of the car as an extension of the person themselves, right? That becomes their real personal space. You want to make sure you respect that. You do not violate it. And from here, we're seeing entirely new types of behavior, which maybe seem a little weird at first, but are actually sort of cool. You're seeing things like um, parking lot picnics, where people are just sort of getting some food, parking in a parking lot, open up the tailgate, and just having like a picnic in the parking lot somewhere. 
Um, so keep in mind that the car is a, a more important way of eating than before, more important way of getting food. And you may want to start thinking about making foods that are really easy or designed to be eaten in the car. And if you want to get really progressive, imagine a future, uh, again, this depends on timelines and when technology and, and government approvals happen, where the steering wheel is taken off those cars and they're driving themselves around, um, you know, uh, by themselves. And inside you just have like a table or something. You'd have a full-blown fork and knife meal one day. So start thinking about car eating, not just for today, but maybe for the future too. Uh, one of the biggest and most important opportunities we think though, is that there's an opportunity to flatten the day park curve. So this is so vital, right? So for the longest time, restaurants have said, uh, boy, I'm really busy during lunch. Boy, I'm really busy during dinner. Uh, but, you know, between two and five, it's just really tough. So maybe you do like, you know, a happy hour at five, maybe you do some sort of midday price promo or something, but you get a little bit of activity, but it's not fundamentally changing your business in a way, at least it hasn't historically. That's because people have schedules, right? You're, you're going to the office and you sort of take lunch at the same time. All of your colleagues take lunch. So, you know, places just get really packed at, at, at noon, let's say. Uh, we're now working from home. And a big chunk of people working from home now say, you know, this is something I may be able to keep doing in the long run as well. Many companies have said, we're not coming back to the office in the year 2020. Some other companies like Twitter have said, we're, we're potentially not coming back to the office ever. We're giving people the option to work from home forever, which is pretty impressive. Uh, so we may see far fewer people in traditional work environments. Because I think one thing that we all learned amazingly quickly uh, in this pandemic in just the first few days is, holy crap, we could actually work from home and be pretty productive in a way that maybe we didn't realize. So uh, a lot of companies may be moving towards models like that where people can electively work from home. So what does this mean? Well, it means you're not sort of beholden to the time schedules of, let's say, your coworkers, where you all have to leave the office at the same time to grab lunch or whatever it might be. Um, so People are now saying, hey, I want to avoid restaurants at peak busy times. I'm maybe not as beholden to a very specific time clock or time schedule the way that it used to before. I have a little more flexibility. So why not grab lunch at 2 p.m., let's say? Uh, that becomes a major opportunity. So imagine what you could do if you could sort of flatten that day part curve, so to speak, and have a more consistent stream of customers coming in throughout the course of the day. Now, this is not a behavior that will happen entirely just by itself. We have to activate this behavior somehow. We have to think about the promotions that will happen in those sort of off hours that will bring people in. We need to think about maybe special menu items that we create to do that. But the potential to convert that to these off-peak hour business opportunities is with us in a way that we've never really had before. So this may be one of the silver linings that the pandemic has brought that we could fundamentally shift the way day parts work. And the way that we wanna think about um, safety, and we're gonna look at a full service uh, example over here. So the question is, what would need to happen for you to feel safe again dining in a sit-down restaurant? So in a sit-down restaurant. And you can see there's some things at the top, right? Spacing out the tables, people wearing masks, a lot of things we've talked about for a number of weeks now, you know, really clean restrooms, gloves, et cetera. But those are the top items that go up to smaller capacity, you know, smaller capacity and beyond and, and above. Those are sort of like your table stakes, um, so to speak. And then you have a whole host of other things that we could potentially do that each would make people feel a little incrementally more safe, but that none of them by themselves is um, ultimately completely required as its own distinct act. And this list is uh, basically just a, a short list out of hundreds if not thousands of different things you could potentially do. And the, the answer is sort of this, that you wanna make sure you cover the table stakes, and then you wanna sort of have a full complete program that includes some of the other items as well. And in a way, it becomes less about the specific action item itself, and more about how they are sort of brought together in a package that makes consumers just feel comfortable. And the thing that we think is most important here is not just um, what that package is, but you do it in a really professional way. So chain restaurants will probably excel at this because it's going to come from corporate and all the signage and the merchandise and the stickers on the floor and whatnot will be professionally printed 
it, it'll feel really well thought out. Independent restaurants might have the hand scribbled note or the uh, police tape that you get at Home Depot or something, and that might freak consumers out because it's going to look like, wow, do they really even think about this? Or do they just sort of cobble this together? So it's really important to do this professionally and show the consumer that you've thought this through. And I would like to invite you on chat based on your experiences or what you've seen to just let us know and let the entire community know, who do you think does a really good job of this? Have you seen any um, restaurants or maybe other stores or other places that just do what do you think is a spectacular job of telling its customers that we are totally keeping you safe, where you felt you know, very protected going in there, you felt like nothing was left to chance. Uh, please share with um, all the rest of us uh, what some of those places are, and if you could even highlight some of the things they're doing, uh, that would be really instructive for us all. Um, and the other thing that uh, to keep in mind is, even in a pandemic, uh, even with all this craziness going on, um, while you're sheltered and home and and you know safety and everything is top of mind, what motivates you to order from a restaurant? The number one thing still is that you have a specific craving. Right, not a general craving, not just a general, hey, I'd like to get some pizza, but a specific craving, right? It's a specific, wow, I cannot wait to get that carne asada torta from this specific restaurant that I really love, right? That is, that is such an important thought, right? Because some, some restaurants, maybe you'll open back up with a smaller menu just because it's going to be easier to manage inventory. Uh, you want to focus on some favorites. Um, some places, may have to think about you know, what they're promoting in your, in your messaging. But the thing to, to really keep in mind is consumers have a specific craveable item on your menu that they really are just thinking about and you wanna make sure you don't lose that. So not the general notion of just some broad type of food, but a specific craving for a specific thing they can only get from your place. That's what you wanna continue promoting around. You wanna make sure the safety message gets through, but get to that craveability factor too. Something unique they can only get from you and probably something you're already pretty well known for. So with that, we thought it'd be interesting to take a look at the operator's perspective. And we'll do a little bit of this each week, a little bit around consumer, a little bit around operator. And let's take a look at the current operator situation. So I wanna debut um, what looks like a scary uh, subway route map, essentially, but it's much more than that. This is the recovery timeline for food service. And what you're seeing plotted here is um, the level of, let's say, business in each one of these segments, month over month, compared to what a normal 2020 would have looked like. So you can see that some segments start recovering a little bit more quickly. Um, some segments uh, ramp up, uh, faster than others, and some segments plateau earlier than others too. So something like travel and leisure, the recovery is already beginning, but it's at a very, very slow rate. And even after recovery ends, eh, we're still down probably about 30% day to day versus what a normal 2020, uh, normal day in 2020 would have looked like. Other segments will recover and get back pretty close to what normal levels of business will look like on a day versus day basis. Uh, you know, if you look at some of the more specific segments like K through 12 and CNU, uh, you know, colleges versus schools, uh, you see there are really differences there, right? Um, school, uh, K through 12 operators, two thirds of them say, I expect things are going to be back to normal in the fall uh, versus just one third of college operators, food service operators say, I think things are going to be back to normal, right? Colleges are more likely to say, hey, I think we might be doing some distance learning or it's unclear if our campus will even be open. Schools have said, yeah, it'll probably be back to normal. And even if they're not, there's probably still probably gonna be other plans to get meals to kids and families uh, somehow. So this is really a segment specific recovery. It's not as though all of food service is gonna come back at the exact same rate. It really is gonna depend <coughs> on the specific segment. And uh, not to go over an eye chart with you, but um, you will get this in the presentation that you can download on Monday both as a PDF and as a PowerPoint, you can see what the month to month numbers look like for the recovery timeline, as well as what it looks like quarter to quarter through the end of the calendar year. <coughs> One other way to think about this 
is let's say the entirety of food service. So this green line plots, not the day-to-day -day, uh, recovery, but the cumulative recovery or cumulative level of, of business for the calendar year. So things are going along pretty well, then all of a sudden in mid-March, we started seeing our declines and the recovery period begins in May, but because we only have a couple of good months up front, it's all being counterbalanced by these you know, downtrodden months. So even though things are starting to get a little bit better, collectively, we're still losing ground for the year for some period of time. We hit a bottom in late July, roughly. Late July is when we'll be most down cumulatively for the year because we'll have several bad months that are counterbalanced by just a couple of good months at the beginning. Uh, but then the recovery becomes so strong that we actually start to close the gap a little bit. And by the end of the year, uh, barring a uh, major impact from a second wave, we think that we'll be down somewhere in the neighborhood of 23, 24% across all segments of food service as an average for the year. So what does calendar year 2020 look like versus what it should have been? It's hard to sort of underestimate uh, or underrepresent just how dramatic this has been for operators. This is perhaps most telling in just how many have actually laid off staff. 63% of operators have laid off staff and nearly 30% have let go of more than 75% of their workforce. You can see the average levels of staff reductions by segment. It's very, very segment specific, but in some segments, more than half the staff has been let go on average. I mean, think about what that means to employment. About 35% of operators have enrolled in PPP. This tends to be more common among full service restaurants, less common among on-site operations, but it's been a relief for uh, an, a pretty substantial number of operators across the country. And if you ask those operators, well, what do you plan to do uh, after the recovery? You know, do you plan to have the same level of staff as you did before the pandemic? Only 46% say, yes, I plan to have the same number of staff I did pre-pandemic. 48% uh, say, I plan to have fewer staff. And you have a few that say, I'm going to have a little bit more. But you only have roughly about half that say, I'm going to be at my same levels of staffing or higher. Another half, 48%, say, I'm going to have fewer people on an ongoing basis. And you can see what those numbers look like here, uh, again, by segment. So this is the percentage of operators in each segment that say they're gonna have a long-term reduction, or maybe we should call it an intermediate term reduction, right? Because we're not looking at years and years and years, we're looking at post-recovery immediately. Do you think your staffing levels are gonna be back to where they were before, or do you think they're gonna be lower? So fine dining restaurants, two thirds say, nope, I'm cutting staff even after things really get opened back up again. Uh, whereas for healthcare, it looks like staffing levels are gonna be roughly similar to what they were pre-pandemic. And operators say, look, I would love to bring back the same people. Uh, if I'm hiring people back, I want to bring back the same people that were already working here. That is my goal. We're all in this together. I'm not really looking to replace current people. I want to bring back those same folks. But there is an issue. And we talked about this a few weeks ago, which is this is the level of unemployment benefit that you get by state. So you can sort of see what the max level of state unemployment is in blue um, for an individual. Then you can see the extra $600 a week that's received um, through the federal government um, right now as part of the relief program. Uh, depending on the state you're in, you could get $800, $1,000 a week not working. It becomes very hard for the employer to say, you know what, please come back, make less money than you are not working, and, put your, and, and have to work, and put yourself in an environment where maybe you can get sick. That's a pretty tough call to action. And it's something that we see operators facing right now where some are not able to bring back fully their trained staff that knows their business already so well um, that the staff they would want to bring back. So there may be a need for more convenience oriented products um, in the short term as some companies may have to hire new people that are not as well trained um, and need things that are easier to use. And we actually see this in the operator research. They tell about 40% of operators say, I want to shift towards more convenience-oriented products. 
operators say, look, if things don't really get better soon or if, or if things are taking longer than I expect, I may have to reduce my operating hours. I may simplify my menu. I may have further reductions in staff, but this is if things take longer than they think. And generally speaking, people, ex operators expect um, traffic to be back starting in September, that they'll be back to full traffic at some point in September or beyond. And we'll see that data in just a moment. And some things that operators are doing right now to, to make life work for them, well, they've of course increased their sanitation practices and they say this is working well. But the other thing they say is working well um, with takeout and delivery is they've created separate pickup areas. Right? So you've probably seen this at restaurants where you go in and they've set up like a station or a table to the side or maybe something even in front of the restaurant designated just for pickup. Uh, this feels to us as though it may be something that many restaurants will continue doing in the long run. Maybe they found another mode of operation, if you will, even after they can have full dine-in and all the other formats of business. Um, and uh, you see this in a number of ways too. So why not have a separate pickup area? Um, you've seen some restaurants and other places convert things. So they have walk-up windows now. They've discovered that, hey, look, I have this thing that could almost turn into like a, a, a window from the street and they've started converting um, their businesses to take orders that way. Um, one of the really popular restaurants here in, uh, in Nashville is um, Hattie B's Chicken, right? The, the hot chicken place. Um, they created a walk-up window. They say, you know what? We've always had this window and we just realized that we had this window. Like we never really paid attention to it, but now that's how you order. You just go up to the window, you feel very, very safe in doing it. And then you walk over to the next window and you pick up your food. So I think this is one of those things that could become a long-term practice and a long-term opportunity for a number of places. Really, you know, you want to offer food in a variety of different ways. And I think we are seeing sparks of creativity that will stay with us even beyond the days of the pandemic. Restaurants are certainly providing masks and gloves um, to their staff. And this is a thing that I think you're probably all seeing in um, the restaurants in your area as well, which is, uh, as dining rooms and stores reopen, initially you saw staff wearing masks and gloves and you saw uh, the patrons also wearing masks and gloves. Now what I see here in, in Tennessee, and I wonder if this is gonna be a leading indicator because this was one of the early open states is the staff is all wearing masks and gloves for the most part, but almost no customers seem to be wearing masks and gloves uh, over here. That's not to say they aren't being safe. They're, they're respecting the, the hash marks on the floor and staying six feet away. But I got to tell you, it looks like maybe 5% of customers I see here going to restaurants in, um, in the Nashville area are wearing masks uh, at this point. It used to be like 80%, it seemed, in the early days of places being reopened. It's really sort of dropped off. But the staff is still doing it. And that's an important thing. So you wanna make sure that you're doing this too as an operator, because most consumers say on, on my last sort of visit to a restaurant, the staff was wearing masks and gloves. If they go into a place that's not doing it, they're gonna say, well, what the heck? How come this place is not offering it up when every other place I've been to has been wearing masks and gloves? So it's vital for the staff. It's unclear whether this will be something that consumers will continue doing. If some of the early open states are in any, any indication, seems like it's, not that much of a consumer behavior anymore inside the walls of the restaurant. About 40% of restaurants, as they reopen, say they will, they will initially reduce their operating hours. This is gonna be a common thing. And again, I, I always sort of wonder, um, I get why you do this. You do this because it helps with your staffing. Like you may not be able to, you know, it's maybe one less shift you have to pay for. It, uh, and maybe it makes sense too, because there's less overall business to go around, but you are essentially squeezing more people into a shorter number of hours throughout the day, which is not necessarily a good thing for promoting distancing, but uh, it is gonna be a pretty common behavior. Uh, almost 40% of restaurants say when we begin opening back up, it's gonna be with fewer hours than we did previously. Uh, and then, you know, here is that opportunity again, which is, uh, the way you read this chart is these are different ways you could offer um, food, sort of like different service modes for offering food. And you have um, in the light green part, you know, the long bar, this is uh, 
the percentage of operators that are currently offering food this way. And the dark part of that is how many are just starting to offer food this way. And curbside is, is really the story. It's super common now and almost, you know, uh, the, the, subs, uh, the substantial majority of places offering curbside just started doing so. It's a brand new mode for them. Um, and two thirds that are offering curbside say they're gonna keep doing this even after shelter restrictions are lifted. So we may have just found, you know, just as with walk-up windows and whatnot, a whole new way of offering food that could stick with us in the long run, uh, which would be great, right? If we could make things a little bit more convenient to the consumer and it's not even just about a safety thing anymore, um, that becomes a, a nice win for uh, restaurants and other away from home food places. So uh, this is one of those things, you know, we hear a lot about how, hey, you know, the, you know, restaurants will never be the same again. I actually agree with that only a little bit. You know, I agree with it to the extent that yes, some things will probably be, you know, different in the long run. But the indications that we've seen, and again, this is just a, an intuition based on all the data that we've, we've looked at, um, is that the new normal maybe is not as dramatically different from the old normal as we were once inclined to think. That said, there are some things that will be net new that will stick around in the long run. And something like curbside might be one of those uh, items and opportunities. So we think that's a great thing. This is yet another way that we could serve food to consumers and make them happy. And I would like to bring back, I think one of the most important uh, insights that we've learned from operators so far and it's a real simple thing. When do you expect to be reopened fully? So you're offering food in all the ways you want, dine-in, whatever. Uh, and then when do you expect your traffic to be back to normal? So the blue line is when you expect to be reopened fully. The pink line, when do you expect your traffic to be back to normal levels? Operators expect to be fully operational pretty soon, like essentially now, right? That's our expectation. We're gonna be reopened, doing what we do. But we don't think traffic is gonna get back to where it uh, once was until September or later. That gap, that window between today and September is the golden opportunity for um, suppliers to the industry to, to work with operators to figure out how to really get things right. That window is the uh, golden window for operators to really think about the way they do business and their menu and everything else and get ready for a return to normal levels of traffic. So I think we are seriously in like run, run, run mode right now, where there is, you know, three months, let's say, of time to really figure things out in anticipation of traffic coming back. And I would encourage, you know, all of your businesses, if you are either a supplier to the industry or if you're an operator yourself, um, really focus on getting stuff rolled out in the months ahead. Uh, because once traffic is fully back to normal, you know, it's really hard to change something that's already in motion. But right now we can do a lot of change, which is great. So uh, with that, I, I want to just talk about what we're going to do next week again. Um, you know, times are certainly interesting and, it's a, and they're very, very momentous and incredibly important. Um, and uh, the story no longer is just about COVID. There are other more important things happening in the world. And we wanted to, to at least acknowledge that and see if we could contribute to the conversation somehow. So next week's webinar is uh, titled United and Inspired Food, Humanity, and a Better Way Forward. It will still be about food. And we are still gonna talk about COVID a little bit. We're also gonna talk about um, what's happening with the current movement and how consumers are responding uh, what they think of how brands should behave during this time and if they support all the brand messaging that we've been seeing or if they have another take. And then to also sort of spotlight some just really cool things that uh, black and minority owned uh, restaurants and other food establishments are doing. Not just because that's how they're owned, but because they're doing things that are really awesome that only diversity could have made possible. You know, think about just food, right? Think about like all the great stuff that we love to have and from all the different parts of the world that's come from. Um, th there's some amazing things there and we want to spotlight that with a particular focus on uh, black owned restaurants and food establishments to really shine a light on uh, some of that uh, amazing stuff that 
again, only diversity can bring. So we hope you'll join us next week. Uh, and again, as a reminder, there's a really good chance that you do not have this automatically in your calendar. So please add it manually. You could use the exact same link you use today. Uh, that link will work every single week for the duration of this webinar series. So just drop it into Outlook so you don't forget. And again, um, thank you. So please stay safe out there. And I hope you all have a great weekend and um, just appreciate the uh, really uh, momentous time that we're in that we are sort of being part of history as it unfolds. And, uh, you know, I said one of the first things we said to our staff here was uh, in that first week of the pandemic is you all should take your phone out and record a video journal every now and then so you can look back on it, play it for your grandkids one day um, and, and see what you were thinking, behaving, doing during those times. Um, that's probably even more true today. So I hope we all get a chance to do that. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye-bye.